Every year, enough glass fiber rebar is produced worldwide to challenge the dominance of steel itself. This isn't science fiction, it's modern manufacturing. The world spends billions fighting rust, repairing bridges and car parks destroyed by corrosion. But there is a solution, a composite material that is twice as strong as steel, four times lighter, and simply does not know the meaning of the word rust. The market for this material is growing at 12% a year, and today you will see how hundreds of bobbins and a barrel of resin give birth to the building material of the future. It all begins at one end of a vast workshop, in front of a structure that looks like a giant library for thread. It's called a creel. On a wall several meters high, hundreds, sometimes thousands of huge bobbins are mounted in neat rows. Wound onto each one is a fine glass thread or roving. This isn't the glass from your windows. It's a special glass fiber produced by melting glass and drawing it through microscopic holes. The result is a thread thinner than a human hair, but with incredible tensile strength. This will be the skeleton. From each of these hundreds of bobbins, a single separate thread is drawn, and they all converge into one thick, fluffy bundle. This river of glass fiber now begins its journey. It passes through a system of guides and tensioners. Each of the thousands of threads must be held at exactly the same tension. If one thread sags while another is too tight, the load in the final product will be distributed unevenly, compromising its strength. The dry glass bundle is then slowly submerged in a bath filled with a thick, sticky, honey-like liquid. This is the polymer resin the flesh that will be built upon the glass skeleton. It's a complex chemical cocktail. The base is typically a polyester, vinyl ester, or epoxy resin. To this, a hardener is added, a catalyst that will trigger a chemical reaction, turning the liquid into a solid plastic. Various additives can also be mixed in. Pigments for color, UV inhibitors to protect the rebar from sunlight, and fire retardants. The purpose of this bath is to impregnate every single tiny fiber. The bundle must be completely saturated in the resin, leaving no dry spots. Now heavy and soaked in sticky resin, the bundle emerges from the bath and heads towards the point of its creation, the forming dye. This is the heart of the entire process. Imagine a thick steel plate with the perfectly round, polished hole, its diameter precisely matching that of the future rebar. The dye is heated to a specific temperature. As the wet bundle is pulled into this hole, several things happen at once. First, the dye acts like a press, squeezing out all excess resin. Second, it compacts all the glass fibers tightly together, forming a perfectly round rod. Third, the heat from the dye initiates the first stage of the curing reaction. Emerging from the dye, we can already see the familiar shape of a rebar, but it is still soft and vulnerable. So how does it get its famous ribbed surface? Immediately after the dye, while the rod is still hot and pliable, a special glass fiber strand is wound around it. A thin resin-soaked thread is wrapped in a spiral around the surface of the rod, creating the textured pattern.
The formed and wrapped rod now enters the longest part of the machine, the curing tunnel, or polymerization oven. This is a long chamber which can stretch for dozens of meters where a high temperature, typically around 200 degrees Celsius, is maintained. Here, the final transformation occurs. This isn't just drying. Under the heat, the resin molecules begin to rapidly link together, forming a strong, rigid, three-dimensional grid. The liquid, sticky syrup turns into an exceptionally strong and hard composite material, permanently bonding millions of glass fibers into a single monolithic rod. As the rebar moves slowly through this hot tunnel, it acquires its final rock-hard strength. But what is pulling it through this long journey? At the end of the line sits a special pulling device. It typically consists of two caterpillar track mechanisms like those on a tank positioned one above the other. They gently but very firmly grip the finished solid rebar and pull it towards them at a constant, precisely controlled speed. It is this machine that provides the force to draw the glass fibers through the resin bath, the forming die, and the oven. The speed of this movement is one of the most critical parameters controlling the quality of the final product. And so, from the other end of this long production line, an endless, perfectly straight, hard and hot GFRP rod emerges. The final act is cutting. An automatic saw is mounted across the line. It synchronizes with the speed of the moving rebar, and at the right moment, it makes a quick forward dash, and with a sharp whiz, it cuts a standard length, for example, 6 or 12 meters from the continuous rod. It then returns to its starting position. The finished, still warm rebars roll onto a cooling table, after which they are collected into bundles tied and sent to the warehouse. And so, before our very eyes, thousands of fragile glass threads and a barrel of sticky liquid have journeyed through baths, presses, and ovens to become the lightweight yet incredibly strong building material of the future. The market for glass fiber rebar isn't yet a giant like the steel market, but it is the boldest newcomer rapidly gaining traction. The global market for this material is already valued in the hundreds of millions of dollars with staggering forecasts. It's expected to grow by 10 to 12 percent annually. Now for the key features that are making the steel industry nervous. The first and most obvious is weight. GFRP rebar is roughly four times lighter than steel of the same diameter. Imagine a lorry it can deliver four times more GFRP rebar in a single trip than it could steal. On the construction site, two workers can easily carry entire coils of GFRP rods, whereas moving steel requires a crane. This represents a colossal saving in logistics and labor. Second is strength. And here, GFRP steps into the ring and knocks steel out in the first round. Its tensile strength is approximately twice that of standard steel rebar. This means that for some structures, a smaller diameter rebar can be used, saving even more on weight and volume.
But the ultimate advantage, the true superpower of GFRP, is its war on rust. The main enemy of any reinforced concrete structure, from bridges to car parks, is not the load, it's rust. Water and salts penetrate through micro cracks in the concrete, reach the steel rebar, and it begins to corrode. Rust expands in volume and literally bursts the concrete from within. And GFRP? It simply laughs in the face of rust. It is chemically inert. It is completely indifferent to water, salt, acids, and alkalis. This means the lifespan of the structure increases dramatically. A concrete structure reinforced with steel is designed for about 50 years. A structure with GFRP rebar can easily be designed for a lifespan of over 100 years. What if a grass could be stronger than steel, yet softer than silk? How can a single plant be transformed into a floor that withstands a hammer blow and at the same time into a fabric that breathes better than cotton? Bamboo grows so fast it can shoot up by a meter in a single day and a single plantation can be harvested for decades without ever being replanted. Every year, over 30 million tons of products are made from it, from bridges and houses to toothbrushes and cars. But there is one thing that even the largest producers don't talk about. Watch until the end and you will learn a secret that will change your perception of this incredible plant forever. It all begins on vast bamboo plantations that cover millions of hectares across the globe. These are not wild, chaotic jungles, but meticulously managed farms. Unlike a forest, a bamboo grove never needs replanting. When a single stalk or culm is cut, its sprawling underground root system, known as a rhizome, immediately sends up new shoots. This makes it one of the most sustainable resources on the planet. Furthermore, a bamboo forest absorbs 35% more carbon dioxide and produces 35% more oxygen than an equivalent area of trees. Harvesters, armed with simple machetes or hand saws, selectively cut only the mature culms. A single mature comb can reach 18 meters in height and weigh over 45 kilograms, making its transportation a complex logistical challenge. When these green towers arrive at the processing plant, the radical transformation begins. First, the long combs are cut into manageable sections. They are then fed into a special machine that, with a deafening crack, splits the round sections into long strips the next step is to strip away the outer green skin and the inner nodes, leaving clean, pale bamboo planks. But hidden within these planks is an enemy of durability, the starches and sugars that are a favorite food for insects and mold. After this, the planks are sent for drying. Some producers air dry them, but for industrial scale, they are loaded into giant kilns where they spend several days until their moisture content drops from 50% down to an ideal 8 to 10%. This stage is critical. Any residual moisture can lead to warping and cracking in the final product. But the journey from an 18-meter comb to a smooth floorboard requires even more impressive engineering. The dried planks are passed through milling machines that give them a perfect rectangular shape. Then, a process begins that looks like the preparation of an industrial lasagna.
here, the bamboo planks aren't just glued together, they are completely shredded into long fibers, mixed with an eco-friendly resin and loaded into enormous steel presses. Under a hellish pressure, reaching over 200 kilograms per square centimeter and high temperature, this mass is forged into an extremely dense monolithic block. The hardness of this strand-woven flooring can exceed 5,000 on the Jonka scale, making it more than three times harder than oak and more scratch-resistant than most traditional hardwoods. However, hardness is just one of bamboo's identities. Its other superpower is the ability to become something incredibly soft and silky. This, known as the viscose process, begins by grinding raw bamboo into a cellulose pulp. This pulp is then steeped in a solution of sodium hydroxide and then carbon disulfide, which transforms it into a thick, viscous liquid. This honey-like liquid is forced under pressure through the tiny holes of a metal plate called a spinneret. Imagine a microscopic shower head. As the thin jets emerge, they enter a bath of sulfuric acid, where they instantly solidify into endlessly long filaments. These filaments are then washed, bleached, dried, and spun into a yarn, from which the final fabric is woven. Over 30 million tons of bamboo are harvested globally each year, and this figure is only growing. From kitchen cutting boards and toothbrushes to scaffolding that can bear the weight of concrete and trim elements in premium cars, this giant grass proves its versatility. It is a testament to how nature, multiplied by human ingenuity, can offer sustainable, strong, and beautiful solutions to countless challenges transforming a fast-growing comb into the gold of the modern world. Bamboo grows both in the wild and on specially cultivated plantations. It is cultivated for the production of building materials, textiles, paper, interior design products, and as a source of biomass. In the wild, there are over a thousand different species of bamboo. It is a perennial, evergreen plant belonging to the grass family. Bamboo is known for its extraordinarily rapid growth. Some species can grow several dozen centimeters in a single day. Bamboo flowers very rarely, and after flowering and producing seed, the plant usually dies. Cultivating bamboo requires specific knowledge and care, including correct planting, regular watering, and choosing the right variety for a specific climate. 